the Lord for his blessings in this time together as we have come to worship the Lord and uh, love him so much, love his word, and love being together with you as we worship the Lord together in Apostolic Church in Whitesboro, Texas, United Pentecostal Church International. It is a joy and a privilege to be a part of this work and to be able to enjoy his presence, his blessings. Amen. And we want to worship together, worship with us this morning as we sing songs of praise to the one who is worthy. Hallelujah, Jesus.
says that makes us a very happy people <laughs> because our God is real he's alive he cares about us amen 
So many today are worshiping deities or gods that have been manufactured in people's minds and lives, and they're not real, and they don't know that. How sad. Amen. And that does make religion empty. It does make it vain. It does make it useless. But to those that call upon the name of Jesus, the name of the only wise God, Jesus is our Savior, Redeemer, Deliverer. He's the Creator of everything. Amen. So in Him, you're complete. Praise the Lord. Because He's the head of all principality and power. There is nothing that He's not over. And so we are complete in Him. Amen. Some worship thousands of gods. I can't imagine that. Amen. I'm glad that God had me at mind when he said you only need one. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Because I can focus on one. I can't focus on that. Thousands of gods. That just that boggles my mind. And uh, you go over to, uh, to other countries and they have just shrines and temples. And, and they're all for different deities, different gods that they worship. And, uh, and bless their hearts. Hallelujah. They just need to know Jesus. Amen. What a great God. Praise the Lord. I want to go into the word of the Lord this morning. I'm excited. I'm thankful for his goodness and his mercy. And uh, I love to share truth out of God's word. Now, truth is not always something that we like to hear. Part of the reason for that is because we don't always have a good grip on truth. Sometimes our truth is, we know we're struggling with it. And so the Word of God is not to discourage us, but to help us to see what truth is so that we can keep reaching for it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we're not going to find him without truth. We've got to have truth, which means that we have to forsake lies. We have to forsake deception. We have to forsake all of the deceit of this world and somehow get our eyes focused on truth. And Jesus is truth. And one of the areas that sets Christianity apart from everything else in this world is forgiveness. It is something that we as humans have issues with. And you don't have to say amen. <laughs> we have issues with forgiveness. And, and understanding forgiveness and how much we should forgive. See, we want to put boundaries on it. How much should I forgive? Amen. And uh, what should I forgive? And what do I not have to forgive? And, and so today we're going to journey into it, look a little bit through God's eyes and our eyes, and try to compare, if we can, the two a little bit to get a better perspective on where we should be in forgiveness. Amen. Forgiveness in God I, God's eyes, and then there's forgiveness in our eyes. And uh, those two can be absolute wor worlds apart. And yet we should be on the same page, but many times we're not. Amen. And so I want to go to the book of Matthew, and we're going to read a little story here that is shared through Matthew's eyes. He shares what he saw and probably what the, the disciples saw on a certain issue. This is Matthew 26, and we're going to begin at verse 6. And, uh, and then we're going to go in a little bit and read Luke's version of it and we're going to see it through a little bit different eyes because Luke records a little bit more of what the Lord was seeing not what we were seeing and so if you're able to stand and honor the word of the Lord this morning we'll do that and uh, we've got about seven verses here to read it's a little bit of a lengthy reading but not too terrible it's a little story but it is an incredible story and nonetheless Matthew 26 and verse 6 says, Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. So their eyes are looking upon it and and she's just wasting all this money. And what is this for? When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work on me. For you have the poor always with you, but we have not. Me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, 
there shall also this that this woman hath done be told for a memorial for her. So we see that this woman has poured out a precious box of ointment. It was very expensive. All the disciples could see here was a waste. And as we'll read a little bit farther, we'll find out she wasn't that reputable of a woman. And so the disciples have issues about this also. And, uh, and no doubt. And so it's, uh, it's a challenge. Amen. Um, and you know, I have got a, I've got a different uh, scripture reference here that is, it's similar, but it's not the same. Uh, but anyway, we want the Lord's will. We want to understand what God sees and what does God want us to see in those around us. And the disciples, as this woman pours out this alabaster box, she sees, the, he sees the, the people see the anointment ointment being a waste of money. Amen. But Jesus says, she's done this for my burying. Amen. This is for the future. This is for the good. Lord, we thank you for your preparation and for all that you're doing. And we thank you, God, for your great love that you have poured out upon us. And God, we pray for guidance in the word this morning as you help us to understand better what your will is in our lives and what you want us to be in the world that we live in. It's so easy for us to misunderstand what you are doing in the world around us. We thank you for your guidance and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. This woman has sought to do a good work, and she has, and God will reward her for that. But the disciples saw it as a waste. Amen. Not understanding that God was allowing this to happen. He was giving this woman an opportunity to be a part of something very special, and that was in preparation of Jesus for his burial and to recognize and honor him in that. And what do we see when we look at people and their gifts, their giving, their, their sacrifices, their, uh, the way that they treat other people, the way that they live? Uh, something I'm, I'm trying to grasp and learn in my walk with God is that even terrible people have good in them. And they're really not much different than we are. And many times it's because there were pressures in their life that pushed them certain directions. There may have been spiritual issues in their life that pushed them certain directions. Um, as a result, they took roads and pa travel paths that we didn't travel. And so therefore, uh, for instance, you take children raised in the inner city where there's a lot of crime and a lot of drugs and a large percentage of those children turn out bad. Now, why is that? Is it because they're just evil? No, it's because they're raised in a bad environment and where they live on the street, they have nowhere to turn. They, their world is ruled by drugs. It is ruled by violence. It is, ru is ruled by the strong survive. And so they go into life expecting to die young because many of their friends die young because of gang-related violence and so on. They're no worse than we are. They're no different than we are. And the fact that I was raised in an environment where there was no drugs, there was no crime, there was no violence, there was no, none of that, and, uh, and I grew up just an American boy. So that makes me good. I'm good and they're not? No, we're in two different environments. If I was raised in the same environment they were raised in, I might well have turned out just like them. But yet I could very easily judge them because they're in prison and they've committed these terrible crimes and they've done all these horrible things when really they're no different than I am. Now, God understands that. We have a hard time understanding that. Because we live in our world. You've grown up in your world. You've experienced the people you've experienced and the life that you've experienced. So have I. But it's different from what they experienced. And it's, it's very challenging for us. And so for the church especially, we have to somehow get to where we see through Jesus' eyes and not through our own eyes. There's another story that I really like in the book of Luke, chapter 7 and verse 36, that shows how that we tend to look through our eyes. Jesus is invited to a, a, a meal at a, uh, at a religious man's house, 
and uh, <clears throat> there's a situation that happens there that is very interesting. Chapter 7 and verse 36, and it says, One of the Pharisees, a religious ruler, desired him that he would eat with him. He went into the Pharisee's house, and he sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat at the Pharisee's house. Now, when she found out that Jesus was at that Pharisee's house, the Bible says that uh, Jesus sat at meat at the Pharisee's house, and she brought a alabaster box of ointment. She stood at his feet before him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee, which was had invited him or bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who or what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. This is kind of our eyes, you know. We look at somebody and we say, oh, I know where you are. I don't kind of like you live. I know who you are. I know what you did. I know what you blah, blah, blah. We got it all figured out, okay? And on top of that, making all this big old hubbub over Jesus' feet, crying on his feet and washing and putting, you know, he's just got issues because all he can see is a mess. Jesus, on the other hand, is looking at a woman who's been broken by her past and is just crying out for forgiveness and attention. Amen. And he knew that if she could be forgiven, she would be committed to him for life. Amen. And that's why he told her, your sins are forgiven. He said to Simon, he said, her sins are many. I know that. That's not the issue here. She wants to be free from them. Amen. And guess what? Nobody wants to live in sin. Nobody wants to go to hell and die in that torment and live in that torment for eternity with the devil and be judged by him. Nobody wants that. I don't care. Hitler didn't want that. All right? Nobody wants that. And sometimes we wish that they were there. Sometimes that we wish in our minds we they should be there. No, they really shouldn't. Because that's not where they want to be. And life has messed them up. And they're where they don't want to be at. Kind of like that dog that's in the pound. They don't want to be there. All right? They don't want to be there in that fire. And so when a Savior steps up and says, hey, no, come on, i got a place for you. I'm going to take care of you. There is an appreciation. There is a bond that grows through that that is priceless. And it's called love. And love is understood through forgiveness. And, uh, and that's what should make us stand out from the rest of the world around us. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15 gives us a word concerning bitterness. Bitterness is something that we will all have to deal with because we're all going to be hurt somewhere in our journey. 12 and 15 of Hebrews. There's a lesson that I received from my father-in-law that was very good. It was about the sycamine tree and it is a very bitter tree. If you were to taste the, the sap of it, it's very bitter. And it, they tend to grow over in the, in the Middle East. Um, they are extremely hard to kill. Their roots grow very, 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 very deep. And so that makes them hard to kill. And, uh, but on top of that, they, uh, the wood that the sycamine tree produces is extremely durable. It just will last forever. And so they like to make coffins out of it because it just will last forever. And, uh, and Jesus taught a parable about the sycamine tree and that we can destroy that through our faith and trust in him. And here he says, Paul is talking, he says, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. Living for God, there are times that we're going to want to get bitter. We're going to want to get 
sour towards people, towards situations at church, a pastor, a marriage, children, husband, wife. It, we can get bitter because we are, don't feel like we're treated fairly or things are not going the way that we think they should. And like that sycamine tree, it will grow deep roots into us. And we may not say anything for a long time, but the whole time this thing is growing in us. And, and it's getting deeper into our spirit and into our nature and into our character until finally we get overwhelmed by this sycamine tree. And the sad part of it is it's incredibly hard to kill. Once you get bitter, you get hateful, you are hurt, you refuse healing, you refuse to be, you're, you're just, and you're not going to forgive, you're not going to get over it. That's the, the bitterness that comes through this. And, uh, and Paul is warning that we don't let a root of bitterness get into our spirit. Uh, and, and we can do that. We can do that with the people in the world around us. We can do that with our community. We can do that with these governors that are trying to control the churches, you know, and the things that they're doing. They don't even know what they're doing, probably. Okay? There are spirits that are controlling and dominating and, and dictating to them, and they don't even know what they are doing. They think they're doing what's right. There's a place in the scriptures where it says that they'll kill the children of God and think they're doing God a service. They think that what they're doing is right. If we're not careful, we get bitter against people and things like that because we don't understand where they're at or why they're doing what they do. And then that bitterness grows in us and it can become almost impossible to kill and to root or take out of our lives. The only thing that will get rid of it is if we are willing to forgive. And we have to ask God. And we need a lot of faith to pluck that root of bitterness out of our hearts. Amen. Because only God can do it. And there are times that we'll think we got that thing completely taken care of and years later realize, eh, I still got issues. <laughs> and you know what we have to do? We have to say, Lord, help them. Oh, God, help me to get over this. Help me to, <laughs> you know, bless them, God. Take care of them, God. Why? Because we don't want that terrible thing growing in our spirit as a child of God. We struggle. And we're talking about looking through God's eyes and looking through our eyes. Through our eyes, all we can see is bitterness. Arr! And God's thinking, man, you need to get over that. And we think we're fine. We think we got it right. We're justified. We, I mean, come on. Now look what they did. Look at how evil they were. And Well, they're no worse than we are. You know? And that's hard for us hard for us to grasp and understand that I've known of people to take animals that were that were incredibly violent and uh, miss they were they were un, unusable and I've known of people to take those animals and work with them and help them to overcome their trust issues their struggles uh, Chet Fisher is a friend of mine that over in Sherman that got a stallion that had been used as a breeding stallion and it was a very very magnificent horse but had been mistreated for so long and his trust was so he hated people he just and this horse was he was vicious and he was and and should be put down beautiful horse and Chet worked with that horse and worked with that horse and got that horse to where it would it was amazing to watch him uh, he would he would hold his hand at the back of his neck here and walk around, and that horse would just put his muzzle against his neck and just follow him wherever he went. Just he could walk around. And that horse would just they became tied. He had to build trust with that horse. He had to build a relationship again with that horse. It wasn't that the horse was evil. That horse had been mistreated badly. And that horse was in a bad temperament. And of course he was a stallion. He was, he, was, he was a male. He was, you know, and he didn't have to put up with that. And so he became where he was a threat. And so what do we do with threats? Do we lock them away and just throw the key away and hope that they die? Or do we 
try to help them and minister to them and pray for them and love them and try to help them to realize they can trust somebody that they don't have to hate everything and everybody around them. There's nothing in this world that doesn't appreciate love. I, I don't think there's any of God's creation that does not appreciate attention and affection. Now, some of them show up better than others, obviously. But, I mean, it's crazy when a, when a rooster will bond with a human and they become like a pet dog. You know, and you think, a rooster? I mean, they're an honorary little, you know? And yet they can do that. Amen. And uh, that bonding, well, that's what God wants. He wants us to bond with Him. But you know what He wants you and I to do? Bond with them. Somehow we've got to help them to realize that even though their life is messed up, they can be forgiven. Even though their life is chaos, they can be healed. Even though they hate the world, they really don't have to. Amen. Because there are people in the world that will love them regardless of what they have experienced. Um, it's vital that we forgive. Uh, we're running out of time. Matthew 18, and verse 23. Matthew 18, and verse 23. We're talking about forgiveness in God's eyes and in our eyes. It can be two different worlds that we live in. Matthew 18, and verse 23. <clears throat> It says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. When he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him a thousand talents. That's a lot. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, his wife and his children, all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant, therefore, fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Give that a second to soak in. But the same servant went out, found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, probably like a dollar, and laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. His fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. He would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were sorry and came and told their Lord all that was done. And when his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desiredest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I have pity on thee? His Lord was wroth and delivered him unto the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. That was a thousand talents. It was a lot. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not, what does he say? Everyone, his brother their trespasses? <laughs> wow. Amen. We're talking about looking through God's eyes and looking through our eyes. We all, there's somebody in the past that we are justified to hate. We are justified to condemn. We are justified to not forgive in our eyes. But he says, you want me to forgive you? You've got to forgive. Not because it's easy. But first of all, they may not even know you hate them. It's you that your gut's being ate out over. And they don't even know you hate them. And every time you think of them, your gut ties them, you think, you got all these feelings. You know what? If you forgive them, just leave it in God's hands, pray for them, maybe God would save them. God would reach them. Well, it's too late. They're already gone. Well, you're still here. You need forgiveness. You need healing. I do too. Amen. And that's what he's telling us here. We need to be willing to forgive. Because God's forgiven us a whole lot more than we realize. And uh, the truth of the matter, when we get to heaven, we're allowed to find out that, wow. You know, you forgave that? Oh, Lord. I didn't realize. At the time, we didn't realize how bad it was. You know, when we were rebelling against our parents, we didn't know how bad that was. We didn't even think twice about it. 
if you had that problem, many of us did. <laughs> you know, they talk about the terrible twos, and then you have the teenagers. You know, teenagers is a whole other ball game because we know a whole lot more words and a whole lot more tricks, and we can throw a whole lot more back in their teeth. You know, and we think that we, yeah, you know, and uh, and yet they forgive us down the road. Why is that? Because they love us. Amen. But if we realize, and, and here's one of the crazy things is, is, as we get older, I don't remember how much trouble I caused my parents. <laughs> but you know what? If they got bitter and hated me over it, they might remember every word and every action and every deed. That's what bitterness does. We can't forget. We can't forgive. Amen. And that's where Jesus is trying to take us today. We need to be willing to forgive. We need to be willing to forget. And let, let bygones be bygones. And work with what we have, not what we don't have. And it's amazing what can happen if we will. In Isaiah chapter 59, we won't read it all for the sake of time. But uh, <clears throat> there's, it's amazing. It's, it's a whole Bible study in itself. Dealing with hatching a cockatrice egg, which is an imaginary egg. It's not real. Amen. And uh, Isaiah 59 and 1. We'll read a little bit about it. Israel is in a mess right here. Isaiah is talking to them. Or should I say the Lord is talking to them through Isaiah. He says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, and neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities or sins have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongues have uttered, muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity or empty things. They speak lies. They conceive mischief. And bring forth iniquity or sin. Verse 5. They hatch cockatrice eggs. And weave the spider's web. He that eateth of their eggs dieth. And that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. Their webs shall not become garments. Neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity or sin. And the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil. They make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Sin. Wasting and destruction are in their paths for the way of peace they know not. There is no judgment in their goings. They have made their crooked paths, them crooked paths. Whomsoever goeth therein shall not know peace. Talking to Israel, and they're in a backslidden condition. They're in a bad way, and he says that they hatch cockatrice eggs. This is evil stories about people. Cockatrice is a fictional monster and a cockatrice to my understanding what I've I've learned is that when we tell a story about somebody and we embellish it and we make it worse and we make them to look worse than they are and we make a big deal out of it and that's why it says that whoever eats this egg dies so if anybody buys into this story it's going to corrupt them and their perception and their understanding and, uh, and if it's broken and shared with others, then it just breaks out and just destroys a lot of people and a lot of good. And, of course, every community has problems with this. Every city, every family has problems with this. Somebody tells a story about somebody, and then that story gets told again and again and again. And what they real, don't realize is they're handing out a cockatrice egg, and it's going to hatch and break forth, and it's going to become more evil and more wicked and more destructive. And so it's just a horrible thing. And it's all born out of an evil spirit. It's all born out of evil thoughts, unforgiving hearts, and so on. Israel was in a bad way. They were not right with God at all. That was what it started out with. We don't want to be there. Amen. We don't want to go there. And if you run across the cockatrice egg, kill it. Somebody tells you a story. Hey, did you hear that such and such and so and so? Say, I'd rather not know. 
and I don't I don't believe that's the case. I don't want any, you know, there's no sense in passing on bad things and blah, blah, blah. And just kill that thing. Don't let it grow. Amen. Because if you go, no, I, what, what happened? And then they'll feel your ear full. You know, that preacher, you know what he did? He's, the next thing you know, man, the preacher's turned into a bad guy. You don't even know it. Amen. Or other people. Amen. We're talking about God's eyes and our eyes and how we look at situations and people. And so be careful that somebody doesn't hand you a cockatrice egg and you don't break it open and do something with it yourself because it'll happen. And the Bible talks about gossiping and church gossip and blah, 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 and all that, you know. And we don't have a problem with it, but it is a real struggle in some churches where people are busy saying, oh, did you see what so-and-so did? Or did you see what so-and-so was wearing? Or did you see where they went? Or did you hear what they said? Or blah, blah, you know. And, oh, yeah, well, you know what I heard? And then you got to make up your own cockatrice egg and send it down the line the other direction. And, and it'll destroy a church. It'll destroy a community. Amen. This is not the will of God. Today, many don't ask for forgiveness because they don't think they have been caught. Think about that. A lot of people not asking for forgiveness because they don't think they caught. They think they're okay. They're getting by. We're good. It's okay. Nobody knows. Except God knows all and sees all. And so the moment we do something wrong, the first one we need to ask God for forgiveness and direction and help and deliverance is Him. Whether it's what we say, what we do. If, if we hand out a cockatrice egg, we need to call back up and say, you know what? I wasn't right to talk that way. I shouldn't have said such and such. So and so. And uh, I'd like you to forgive me of that. And ended. Amen. This is how we keep the kingdom of God alive and well, and the family of God alive and well. And this is how we forgive one another. And instead of breeding hate and anger, we breed love and forgiveness. Who is forgiven much ought to love much. And I don't know about you, but I've been forgiven a lot. Amen. And I have an obligation to love a lot. And as I've said before, in the kingdom of God, this is so amazing to me in God's eyes. But he said, pray for your enemies. And you may be the only one praying for them. And if God can save them because you prayed for them, who's going to be waiting for you in heaven? Your enemies. To thank you for praying for them. Because we forget who we are. We're children of God. We're the children of the king. And if we ask our heavenly father to do something for us, and he can, he will. Think about that. And if we didn't pray for them, they're done. Because now not only are they going to hell and nobody's going to reach them, but they're going to have judgment because of what they did to us. Stacked on top of it. Now you, you try to weigh that out in your mind and find the balance to that. You know, we could be the reason that they wind up in hell with extra judgment or they could make it to heaven because we prayed for them that God would deliver them and redeem them. That's mind boggling, you know, and but our natural thought process is they did me wrong. They deserve X, Y and Z. But it's easy for us to forget that somebody else is watching us and all of our slip-ups. And they're, they're on a daily basis, you know. We, we, we. And if God was to call to our attention, we would have a real, we'd have some real issues. Because we just, okay, there's nothing right, I'm just worthless. We'd be so depressed and discouraged. And, and God said, that's all right. You're going to get through it. I'm going to help you get over that. And then we'll move on to this. And we'll You've got a whole lot more you're going to experience. So just hang in there. It's, it's all good. This is part of the learning process. It's called the learning curve. Amen. He's going to get us to heaven, church. And the beautiful part of this is we get to help others. And they're not as evil as they look. They're just damaged. They're hurt. They've traveled roads that we can't identify with. They may have baggage that we can't understand. They may have mental struggles. They may have things that have been done to them in the past we would have no idea of. And so what do we need to do? We just need to love them, pray for them, and let God bring healing. 
when it comes down to how many times should you forgive them, Jesus told Peter, he says, you know, Peter said, well, Lord, if my brother sinned against me, how many times should I forgive him? Seven times in a day? No, oh, Peter, 70 times seven in a day. So, the Lord doesn't want us to get hung up on holding people guilty, judging them, talking about them, digging up their past, trying to figure out how evil and bad they are. He wants us to be merciful, kind, forgiving, and encouraging them on their way. Now, we may not be able to bring deliverance into everybody's life, but we can bring kindness into everybody's life. Yeah. Amen. That, uh, that, that horse that Brother Chet Fisher worked with, uh, he had to devote a lot of his time and energy to help that horse get out of the place that it was in. Not everybody can do that. Okay? But we can be kind to them and we can be speak kind to them, not hand out cockatrice eggs about them, not say, you know, because what purpose does that serve? It doesn't help anything. Now, I'm not going to say there's not times where you don't have to warn somebody. <laughs> there are times, there are people that have come and used the church and abused the church and they'll move on to another church. And if I talk to the pastor and I say, well, yeah, but they do have a struggle with this, so be careful. You know, uh, If somebody comes through and all they want is money, 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 and they won't do anything and they don't, they're not going to, well, then you realize money's not helping them. So you still love them. You just are careful about giving them a bunch of money. If that's enabling them and just helping them to continue on being crossways with God, then, you know, it's, there's a little bit of wisdom used there. I mean, you can't help them. It just means you have to be wise how you help them. Amen. And so we, we try to help people. Everything that we do, we try to do it for their benefit. And God gives us wisdom in this journey. Let's stand to our feet. And I want to encourage us to pray for those that have hurt us. There's some that have hurt you in the past, some that have done wrong to you. And you're probably justified to be angry at them or upset with them. But I want to encourage you today to pray for them, pray forgiveness, and pray for them that God will deliver them and that they can be redeemed. And, and maybe they've already gone on to their reward, so you have no control over their destiny at that point. But God does. And, uh, and God knows. And uh, he's forgiven us of so much. Father, we thank you for this word today, God. And we thank you, Lord, that you look through eyes of forgiveness and healing and deliverance, God. But you also require on our part that we would be willing to forgive. We would be willing to heal and do whatever we can to bring peace into the world of those around us, God. And so, Lord, I pray for forgiveness in my life, God. Anything I've said or done, anything that I've spoken, anything that I have not handled properly, God. I pray for forgiveness and mercy in that, Lord. And God, help us as we move forward in this to be forgiving and loving and compassionate as you are, Lord, realizing that everyone around us would love to be forgiven, whether they're worthy or not, God. We all want to be forgiven. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be willing to forgive much and, uh, and we can love them much as a result of that, Jesus. And we know through your word that you love us much and you will forgive us much if we're willing to forgive others. Thank you for this word today. Thank you for this. This is a door of opportunity. It is a window of opportunity for us. And Lord, we can go through this if we want to or we can choose to shut it and stay on the other side for a while. But sooner or later, we're going to have to forgive and we're going to have to find a way to put them in your hands and pray your blessings on them. Thank you for your blessings and guidance. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody said amen. amen.